Good morning, Cross Point. How are you guys this morning? So I'm excited this morning that we actually have a guest preacher. His name is uh, Greg Heinch. He's the lead pastor from Celebration Community Church down in Celebration. So he's here to share with us this morning. And I know we just started the book of Esther last week, but we're going to be taking a short one-week break. We'll be picking that back up next week in chapter two in the Esther series. And this morning, uh, Pastor Greg is going to be preaching from one of my favorite chapters in the Bible in Colossians chapter one. So I'm thankful to have him here along with his wife of 37 years. That's right. That's incredible. Such a, a testimony of, of God's faithfulness. So I want to pray for Pastor pray. Greg and uh, looking forward to what God has placed on his heart for us this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for, for Pastor Greg. I thank you for his uh, faithfulness and I thank you for the opportunity we have to um, hear from your word this morning. And so, Lord, I pray that um, you would prepare our hearts, that you would uh, give Greg just the clarity of, of speech and the things that you have placed on his heart for us this morning. And Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that our hearts and minds would be transformed by the power of your word this morning. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Turn with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. It's really good to be uh, back with Crosspoint. I'm thankful for Crosspoint, what God has done and is doing in and through the ministry of Crosspoint. Uh, God used this church, especially during a, a difficult time of our lives as we transitioned from uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin area here to Central Florida some 13 years ago. And uh, the partnership has been valuable to us through the years. It's good to be with you. But I want to turn our attention to God's Word, Colossians chapter 1. I want to read verses 9 through 14, where Paul writes this. And so from the day we heard, that is the way we heard about the gospel growing and bearing fruit in Colossae and also around the world, from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." In the movie Jackie, which traces the desperate days of Jacqueline Kennedy following the assassination of her husband, there is a scene where she is walking on this long, a beautiful tree-lined path, listening to a well-seasoned priest as he tries to console her. And the climax of his counsel hardly offers any hope at all to the grieving widow. He says to her, there comes a time in man's search for meaning when one realizes that there are no answers. And when you come to that horrible and unavoidable realization, you accept it or you kill yourself or you simply stop searching. That's what he said to the grieving Jacqueline Kennedy. I want to talk about living this morning. I want to talk about walking through the limited number of days that we have here on this planet. And I want to talk about a very certain kind of living. If you agree with the priest in the movie that there really are no answers to life 
and its perplexing questions. Then, I guess, a resigned hopelessness or trying to end the pain by ending your life seem like attractive, perhaps the only options that you have. But think of it, sadly. Here is a representative of Jesus Christ whose comfort displays an astonishing ignorance of the Bible's message or, if he does know the Bible, an astonishing lack of faith that it might be true. But the Bible's constant emphasis is that life has purpose, that what we choose to believe and the behavior that flows from what we believe really does matter, and that even the tragedies and profound disappointments that we experience are part of a drama much larger much more enduring and far greater, of far greater importance than our own lives. It is a drama that culminates in the exaltation of Jesus Christ as the great all in all. The one with the name above every other name, before whom every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is indeed the Lord of all, or as Paul says in this letter, he is the preeminent one, the supreme one over all matter and all energy, over time and space, over every human or spiritual being who lives or ever has existed. He is the point of everything. Get your head around that. Our lives were created, and the providential ordering of our lives is designed with this same goal in mind, that the fullness of Christ and his glory would be displayed and magnified and valued and validated and celebrated for endless eons to come. That's the story of which we are a part. That is why we are here. This is the goal that influences how God makes all the decisions that he makes and all the decisions he makes about what to ordain in our lives. And this doesn't answer all of our questions, but I wish someone had been there to assure Mrs. Kennedy that she was not trapped in a horror movie of a life with no point. And if indeed Jesus is the point of everything, then the highest aspiration that I could ever pursue in life is to please him. Or to use Paul's language from verse 10 of our text, the highest aspiration of which I am capable as a human being, is to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To walk is just a Jewish metaphor for living, for conducting your life. And so, do you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? You say, well, no one can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that's true if we're talking about somehow deserving all that the Lord has done for us. No one lives in such a way that they earn salvation or earn forgiveness or earn the new birth or the infilling of the Holy Spirit or the privilege of being part of Christ's church. None of us earn or deserve it. And how do I know that that's not what Paul is talking about here? Because verse 12 says, that it is the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So Paul is not saying, qualify yourself for heaven. He's not saying, be perfect, never sin. 
That's not what he's saying when he calls us to walk, to live in a worthy manner. So what does he mean when he says we're supposed to live in a manner worthy of the Lord? Well, D.A. Carson has a really helpful book on the prayers of Paul. And in it, he says, we might have a clearer vision of what it means to live worthy of the Lord if we lived in a shame culture. In a shame culture, one of the worst things that you can do is bring shame upon your family, upon your clan or your tribe. And then he tells this story. Not long ago, a Korean student pursuing a research degree at a well-known British university approached me to ask if I could give him some advice. And his problems were simple and complex. At the simple level, he was failing rather badly in all of his work. And it was clear that the university was going to squeeze him out of the program. He needed to come to terms with this hard reality. And yet at a deeper level, he had a family back in Seoul. And his mother and father had sacrificed to send him to the United Kingdom. And they could not conceive of the possibility that their son would not make the grade. The student was utterly distraught. His parents and siblings were pressuring him to succeed in some way, maybe transfer to another university program, maybe uh, take on a different degree than the one you were pursuing. But, but if he were ever to return home without a degree, he would bring devastating shame upon the entire family. In the Western world, we do not, bar, by and large, think in such terms. Of course, some families operate that way, and no one with any sensitivity at all wants to disappoint loved ones who may have sacrificed for us to be able to forge ahead with our lives, and still... We do not live in such a shame-based culture. Rugged individualism pervades much of Western ideology, and whatever shame that we feel is rather slight compared to the shame brought on by corporate pressures imposed on people in many cultures of the world. But in a shame culture, people are taught that they must be worthy of their family's name that they must be worthy of their country, worthy of their heritage. By contrast, many Westerners are applauded when they act in stubborn independence of their peers. But here, in Paul's world, to be a Christian, to confess Jesus as Lord meant to adopt a worldview in which you were bound to please him in every way. And not to do so would be to bring shame on the one whom you confess as Lord. And of course, a shame culture can manipulate individuals with terrible cruelty. And the, the price of social cohesion can be destruction of individual integrity. And in the same way, the church can thunder the truth that Jesus' name is to be lifted up and yet do so in a way that people are manipulated or are driven by guilt or power without mercy or conformity without any grace. But most of our churches in the West are plagued with a different sort of problem. And that is many of us think that we can just go on sinning with impunity. Too often we think, well, since Jesus is nailed to the cross, I can keep on sinning. It's my job to sin, his job to forgive me. Somewhere we got the idea that we can be Christians and yet we don't have to live in a way that is worthy of the Lord. And in fact, in many churches, if you actually expected people to live in a manner worthy of the Lord, what would happen? You would immediately be labeled as a legalist or judgmental 
or intolerant, or you'd simply get a shrug that exposes the deadly indifference by which they live. If we profess Jesus as our Lord, Jesus as our Savior, then we are to live our lives in such a way that we are worthy of him. But, it needs to be said, we don't get to define what it means to live worthy of the Lord. If we did, we might define it in a way that it was defined in my churches growing up. Short hair for guys. Short hair for guys. Skirts not above the knees, hair not above or below the ears. No movies, no dancing, no drinking, no smoking, no card playing. We were against a lot of things. And perhaps for good reason. But you'll notice, if you were listening as I read Paul's uh, verses here, you'll notice that as Paul describes a life worthy of the Lord, his emphasis is not on what to avoid. His emphasis, when he talks about living worthy of the Lord, is what to pursue. What to make a priority in your life. What to be intentional about. And because of the importance of getting this right, I, I want to tear apart this text, dig into it this morning by highlighting five characteristics that Paul mentions about a life lived worthy of the Lord. Let's let him define it for us. A life worthy of the Lord. We begin with the first half of verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So a life worthy of the Lord starts with a commitment to regular prayer. Paul already said this back in verse 3. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. A couple of observations. First, we want to keep in mind that Paul is praying for people who have already heard and received the gospel. In fact, they have become models, Paul has indicated already, in uh, models of faith and hope and love. They have a faithful minister on their behalf, Epaphras, and they keep growing and bearing fruit. When we live in a, li a life worthy of the Lord, we do not assume that perseverance automatically happens. We don't stall out because we think to ourselves, well, I'm close enough to Jesus. Uh, I, I'm enough like Jesus. I, I've been obedient for so long now, I think I need to take a break. Paul doesn't think, oh, the Colossians are already Christians, I don't need to pray for them anymore. No, it's, it's like an athlete who qualifies for the Olympics. You don't say, well, I don't need a coach now because I qualified. You say, I need six or seven coaches now. That's Paul's thinking here concerning the things he asks for on the Colossians' behalf. Second observation, you'll notice that Paul never ceases to pray for them. Which means what? At the very least, it means that he sets aside regular times in life for prayer, and he continues on throughout his day in constant conversation with God about what God is doing all around him and what God may be up to in the lives of the Colossians. D.L. Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. It's been said that there is more that you can do after you pray, but there is nothing you can do until you pray. Or the great Hudson Taylor, after whom we named our third child. The prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness and failure and disappointment, then let us answer God's standing challenge. Call upon me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you haven't even thought of yet. To live a life worthy of the Lord starts with prayer. Secondly, it depends on God 
for some very specific things. Still, verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So knowledge of God's will that manifests itself in these qualities. Wisdom, which is just a, a, a certain level of mental excellence about taking truth that you understand and applying it to life. That's what he prays for the Colossians, that they'd have that kind of wisdom and that they would have understanding, which is the ability to think through a subject coherently and clearly, but to do it with a sensitivity to God's spirit. Don't you want that quality in your life? When you're watching the news, when you're translating the circumstances of your life, you're wrestling with what God is up to, you want to do all of these things, process all of this data coming at you with a sensitivity to God's spirit, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is what Paul prays for the Colossians. And Carson comments, is there anything that our own generation more urgently needs than this? Some of us have chased every fad, scrambled aboard every bandwagon, adopted every gimmick, pursued every recommendation of the media. And others of us have rigidly cherished every tradition, determined to change as little as possible, worship what is aged simply because it is aged. But where are the men and women whose knowledge of God is as fresh as it is profound? Who delight in thinking God's thoughts after him. And that ensures that their study of the scriptures is never merely intellectual or self-distancing. Whose desire to please God outstrips residual and corrupting desires to shine in all of life. Where are the ones with spiritual wisdom and understanding. The Lord is worthy of this. Thirdly, a life worthy of the Lord translates knowledge into actions. Verse 10. And so, may, may, you, have, may you be filled with the knowledge of his will, all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, Who's him? Jesus, the Lord Jesus. To walk worthy of the Lord means that we make it our highest priority to please him. And so we don't just acquire spiritual wisdom and understanding. We actually use these things then to live fully pleasing to the Lord. A book that's had a profound influence on my life was written in 1728 by William Law called The Serious Call to Devout and Holy Life. Um, it just breaks me in all the right places. He touches on this issue. If you stop here and you ask yourself why you are not so devoted as the early Christians, your own heart will tell you that it is neither through ignorance nor inability, but purely because you never thoroughly intended to be like them. Now, who can be reckoned a Christian while lacking this genuine, sincere intention? If we can find any Christians who sincerely intend to please God in all their actions as the best and happiest thing in the world, whether they be young or old, single or married, men or women, if they have but this intention, it will be impossible for them to do otherwise. You see two persons. One is regular in public and private prayer and the other is not. Now, the reason for the difference is not that one has the strength and power to observe prayer while the other has not. The reason is one intends to please God in the duties of devotion and ha the other has no such intention. Here, therefore, let us judge ourselves sincerely. Let us not vainly content ourselves with the common disorders of our lives, the vanity of our expenses, the folly of our diversions, 
the pride of our habits, the idleness of our lives, the wasting of our time, fancying that these are just such imperfections as we fall into through the unavoidable weakness and frailty of our nature. Rather, let us be assured that these disorders of our daily life are owing to this, that we have not so much Christianity as to intend to please God in all the actions of our life as the best and the happiest thing in all the world. Because he said, if you believe that, nothing can stop you from living that way. Fourth, to live a life worthy of the Lord means to demonstrate observable evidence of the Lord in your life. Middle of verse 10. So, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. And now we get into these four participles. Bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, and giving thanks to the Father. So, those are four participles that unpack for us evidence that we are living to praise the Lord, that He is at work in our lives, that His Spirit is at work in our lives. Four participles. The first one, bearing fruit in every good work for God. This is exactly what Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, that we have been saved by grace through faith. It's all a gift, so no one can boast. But it goes on to say that we can't boast in, every, in anything we do because we are God's work of art. That we have been recreated in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. He saved us, empowered us, made the good works so that we would walk in them. It's all from God. We're all bearing fruit of his life in us. And of course, we all have different kinds of gifts and temperaments and passions. So the fruit that we produce will all be somewhat personalized. But the point is that there will be fruit. Remember John 15, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Some of us specialize in growing oranges and some grapefruits or lemons or cherries or peaches, but Paul would never imagine what is so common today, a genuine Christian brought alive by the very life of God, living a life worthy of the Lord without any fruitfulness in good works. That just wouldn't make any sense to Paul. Not because you weren't anything, but because when God radically changes you on the inside, it shows up in terms of fruitfulness. We are fruit-bearing plants. If there is no fruit, it is a sign that there really is no life. Second participle is increasing in the knowledge of God. And the key word here for our purposes is increasing. Where, what is the trajectory of your life? Again, Carson. Christians are organisms that grow, not machines that simply perform a designated function for which they were designed. To learn something of God's will and to use such knowledge to live a life worthy of the master and utter utterly pleasing to him, is to engage in the business of obedience. But as you get busy in the business of obedience, guess what happens? You get to know God better. And that, in turn, impels you to more obedience, which, in turn, opens up new vistas in the knowledge of God and his will. And, of course, as your knowledge of God and his will improves, you're driven to greater obedience. And such obedience is one point of access to greater knowledge of God and on and on and on. So this is not a pointless cycle. It's a spiral. Obedience, know God better. More obedience, know God better. It's what you, it, it changes you. It, may, it changes your desires. It fuels itself and necessarily demonstrates itself by fruitfulness in life. Third participle here, being strengthened by God for endurance and patience with joy. What is remarkable is that the power 
for which Paul prays is frequently tied to the power of the resurrection. But its demonstration among believers, at least in the first instance, is found not in miracles, not in their own resurrection. The evidence that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you shows up because you have great endurance and patience. You are, giving some, you are given something from God that is so far beyond human capacity. It's the power of the Spirit of God enabling you to endure, to have patience, and not just endure and have patience, but to have patience with joy. Do you understand how counterintuitive, counternatural this is? How supernatural this is? That you not only endure the bad traffic or whatever it is that gets under your skin, you, you know that God is up to something good here. So you endure with patience and with great joy. When you endure challenges in your life with joy, God's power in you has done that. And that joy is worthy of the Lord. Fourth participle, giving thanks to God. It's worthy of the Lord to be overflowing with gratitude all the time. The quadriplegic Johnny Erickson Tata, giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful, it's a matter of obedience. The pilgrims made seven times more graves than huts, and nevertheless they set aside a day of thanksgiving. Helen Keller said, so much has been given to me that I have no time to ponder that which I don't have. Living a life worthy of the Lord just has thankfulness all the time, all over the place. You just are stunned. You can't get over what God has done in blessing you countless ways. Now, this takes enablement of the Holy Spirit to lure you away from all of the distractions and to see God's hand, His good and faithful hand in everything. I am thankful for the teenager who's complaining about doing dishes because it means that he or she is at home and not on the streets. I'm thankful for the taxes I pay, because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for the mess to clean up after a party, because it means I've been surrounded by friends. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little too snugly, because it means I have enough to eat. I'm thankful for my shadow that watches me work, because it means I'm in the sunshine for a lawn that needs mowing and windows that need cleaning and gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. I'm thankful for all the complaining I hear about the government because it reminds me that we have freedom of speech. For the parking spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means that I'm able to walk and that I've been blessed with transportation. For my huge AC bill because it means I'm cool. For the person behind me in church who sings off key, because it means I can hear. For the pile of laundry and ironing, because it means that I have clothes to wear. For weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day, because it means I've been capable of working hard. And for my bedside alarm that goes off in the early morning hours because it reminds me, I am alive. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice in this day. That's a life worthy of the Lord. You know what the Lord thinks of complaining. And if you forget what he thinks of complaining, just look it up in a concordance sometime and you'll be reminded quickly. But when the Spirit of God fills you, you just walk around like this. I can't believe it. Look at that sun. Look at the clouds. Smell that. My friends, my family, the privilege of being able to have a brain that works, lungs that process the air I breathe. You would give everything you have to get them back. But you get to enjoy them for nothing because of this great, generous God. Fifth and finally, a life worthy of the Lord means that I maintain clarity about my identity. Now, follow me on this one. Clarity about my identity. In verse 12, so giving thanks to the Father who has 
who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of, in light, who has delivered us from the domain of darkness, has transferred us to the kingdom of, of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. This is who I am in Christ. Think of it now. Think, don't exempt yourself. Think of this personally. Qualified, delivered, transferred, redeemed, forgiving, forgiven, you, forgiven, all sins, past, present, and future, paid for in full at the cross so that you were able to be transferred into his kingdom, qualified for your inheritance that awaits you, delivered from sin, evil, judgment. Living a life worthy of the Lord is not moralism. It's not legalism. It's not what you have achieved. It's about embracing and magnifying what God has done in you. When I know who I am in Christ, it delivers me from the fear of man, from the obs obsessive need to keep comparing myself with other people to see if I'm worthy. It delivers me from the fear of the future, that I don't have to fall back into fear because I'm adopted. And I, I have been given, I, I have been uh, under the care of my Abba, Father, and even when the difficult times come, even when I'm called upon to suffer in some way, if I stay clear on the issue of who I am at my core because of Christ, I face that difficulty with confidence that God is bringing eternal good out of this pain. So there it is, a life worthy of the Lord. We learn so much from Paul's prayers and... You can learn so much by listening to the way you pray. One more mention of Carson. We must ask ourselves how far the petitions we commonly present to God are in line with what Paul prays. Suppose, for example, that 80 or 90 percent of our petitions ask God for good health, recovery from illness, safety on the road, a good job, success in exams, the emotional needs of our children, success in our mortgage application, and much more of the same. How much of Paul's praying revolves around equivalent items? If the center of our praying is far removed from the center of Paul's praying, then even our very praying may serve as a wretched testimony to the remarkable success of the process of paganization in our own lives and thoughts. In other words, let's ask the Spirit this morning to make us want what Paul prays for. To want these things. To value them more than health, more than wealth, more than getting my mortgage application to go through. Let us walk and live and pray in a manner worthy of the Lord. Is that your intention? Life does have purpose. And it's found in living worthy of the Lord. To continually remind us that life is all about himself, Jesus instituted a practice that we call communion. And if you remember the words of Jesus when he instituted this, communion is about remembering. Remembering Jesus. Remembering who he is and what he achieved, and to remember that he's coming back soon to take us home. If you are a Christian, if you have confessed all known sin in your life and you're living at peace with other believers, then you're welcome to participate in communion this morning and to remember Jesus. It's our practice to come forward, take the bread, dip it into the cup, the bread representing his body, the cup representing his blood. By taking it into yourself, you're saying, I depend on Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of my sins, the hope of eternal life, and a life that is worthy of him. Jesus, complete what you have begun in me for your glory and for my joy. Let me pray.